Hey there, uh, my name is Abdeli Kothari. I'm the CTO at Corridor Platforms. And in this talk, we're going to be talking about how to handle configuration management for Flask applications. Corridor Platforms is a technology company where we build a web-based platform. And Flask is at the core of all the kind of backend APIs and so on and so forth that we are creating. And we, we have to deliver our platform to both kind of setups, right? It could be small instances, which are just quick and easy to set up, but also to enterprise instances where some of our clients need us to integrate with all their entire enterprise architectural setups. So one of the things that we were focusing on a while back was how do we handle configurations for both of these kind of requirements that we had? Be nimble enough to handle some of the smaller loads that we have, but also be robust and stable for the larger loads that we have. And this is basically a case study of how at Corridor, we were able to figure out a very nice and flexible way of handling our configurations. Now, whenever we talk about configuration management, the first thing that actually comes to my mind is 12-factor application. The 12-factor application, as you can see, is a methodology for building SaaS apps. Think of it like a, a Zen of Python or just a bunch of guidelines on how web developers should organize and manage their application. So it has some of the very basics, like ensure that you have a single code base, but multiple instances that you're deploying to, whether it's production, staging, developer instances, and so on and so forth. It also has dependency declaration, like requirements, files, uh, setup.py, and so on and so forth in Python. And the third one is configuration management. So configuration management is an important aspect for applications, right? Because if you want to have a single code base to be able to customize your deployments and instances, you need to have a configuration which can then tell your instance that this is the way to behave. It could be, you know, spit out a lot, a lot of debugging information and profiling information for developer environments, but be still very robust and fast for production environments. And there are nine other uh, things that are mentioned in the 12 factor application. So feel free to go and take a look at it. It's an interesting read if you haven't seen it yet. Now, when we talk about enterprise configuration management, right? Enterprise and lightweight are normally two sides of the spectrum. So when we talk about lightweight, we're talking about easy to set up, very quick installation, just easy to handle things. But for enterprise, we want to talk about robustness, security, stability, and all of those kind of heavier words that you need to handle, right? And we're talking about just easy to change things. Like you don't want to spend even more than like two minutes to go and change a configuration file in a lightweight setup. But in an enterprise setup, you actually want to have like a change management cycle with approvals and all of those kind of things because you want it to be very tightly controlled and auditable. On the lightweight side, you actually want your configuration to be fairly tightly coupled with your application, right? Like let's say the Flask configs. We just want it to be very native to your application and easy to modify the behavior of your application, either even through a UI if necessary. But on the enterprise side, a lot of times, especially for secrets and some of the uh, you know, configurations which are sensitive, you want to have a standardized area where you're doing all your configurations. And then you just want your application to read from that centralized location so that all your security policies and so on and so forth are managed centrally in one single location. So lightweight and enterprise are quite different, but let's just talk, because lightweight is something that every hobby programmer starts with. Let's just talk about how to handle enterprise setups. Now, sadly, the, the answer over there is it kind of depends, uh, because whenever we talk about enterprise architecture, there's no silver bullet of how that should be architected. Normally, an enterprise architecture is all about what the enterprise wants to achieve, right? It's heavily dependent on the enterprise, the kind of work they want to do, the kind of domain they're working with and the kind of speed they want to handle and so on and so forth. So whenever we talk about enter enterprise architecture, it's all about actually being able to customize and behave in an environment which is very specific and gonna be very demanding for the kind of setup that you are supposed to follow, right? It's basically like you're in a boot camp and you just have to follow the kind of rules that are being imposed by the enterprise. So what you want is just an excessive flexibility requirement, right? We just want to be flexible enough to be able to mold to whatever kind of setup that you're going to be put in. And that's what we thought about at Corridor. Now, if I'm just to compare what we normally have by default provided in Flask, right? Flask configuration management, in my mind, is a lightweight, but fairly enabling version of configuration management. 
So it supports Python files, objects, Toml, JSON, all of these which you may have used in the past, which just makes it easy for you to use whichever format you want. It has cascading effects. So you could have a base settings file and then you could have an instance settings file, which can then be merged into a common setting for your instance at that moment. And then you have environment switching, right? You have dev environments or templates of environments, dev environments, testing environment, production environments, which you can easily switch between. So all of these are already provided in Flask. I'm not gonna go too much in detail because all of these are things that you may have used already in the past. Now let's talk about what's missing in the standard configuration methods. External sources. Now external sources is important for centralization. Right? If you are keeping all your configurations in a central location, your application needs to read from that external source just because all your security policies at an enterprise are already configured at the central location and then applications don't need to or don't have the risk of implementing all of those security policies. So that's an important aspect, which currently Flask doesn't support. And you have ways of avoiding it. So you could in your Python file itself, just write out logic. You know? If you want to do environment variables, you do import OS, os.environ or import requests and you can actually make an API call using REST API with tokens and so on and so forth to fetch credentials. But all of them is actually logic that you need to write. And then that's not really more into configuration. That's more about the kind of storage mechanisms you want and helper functions and so on and so forth. So you have a, a separation of concern issue, right? Your configurations are not about configurations anymore. Then you have advanced merge strategies. Now Flask already does provide the cascading settings. But you may also want to do more advanced merge settings for advanced data structures, like let's say dictionaries, lists, and so on and so forth. And we'll go into that. And then comes uptime. So you have a runtime reloading mechanism. So whenever I go and change a configuration file in Flask, I mean, obviously I'm not using a development works your hot reloading server in production. So I need to go and restart my server, right? Which is not a great idea because that just means that I will have to be down for a certain amount of time. So that's another concern that comes up when we talk about enterprises. And there are many others, you know, you want better validations when you're talking about enterprises, you want better documentation, encryption mechanisms, you know, casting to make sure you're not mis misunderstanding something and so on and so forth, right? All of these are kind of capabilities that we at Corridor wanted, which we could not find in, let's say a standard library like config parse or even in Flask configurations. And then we were just looking to, there is third party mechanisms that are present in Python and Flask. So we actually came across Dynaconf, which was a pretty interesting library. It's created by Bruno Roca. You can take a look at it in PyPy, in GitHub, or even the website dynaconf.com. We actually evaluated many potential libraries over here and kind of zeroed in on Dynaconf just because of the ease of migration, the kind of lightweight solutions it also provided, and also just how similar it was to actually Flask config. So let's maybe take a look at it. And oh, hey, whenever you're going to be adding any new tool to a any any new tool to our project, we do need to think about various things. Right. So first is migration, which is the biggest issue. How do we migrate to the tool and the way we need to handle it, and so on and so forth. Moving existing configuration files also can be bothersome at some points. And the next one, once we migrate and we come back to a stable usage, we talk about extending and using the functionality provided by this new tool. Right? That's when we are exploiting the tool so that we can leverage all the capabilities it has in an easy way. And then goes to customization and advanced usage, right? Just saying we've already used all the capabilities that let's say Dynacon provides. Now, can we also additionally customize and add new functionality, which you could potentially even go back and contribute to the open source teams out there. So let's first talk about migration, where right? we were talking about using existing Flask configurations and moving to Dynacon. Now, migration is actually just like a five minute effort in Dynacon, maybe even less. What you do is you install Dynacon using pip, pip install Dynacon in your virtual environment, and then you just run Dynacon in it. This will go ahead and create a config.py file. And because I've given the format as Python, it's also creating a settings.py and a secrets.py. And even go above that and actually go and add my secrets.py in my git ignore so that I don't commit it to git by mistake. So, the config.py creates a dynaconf settings variable that we'll see in, in the next slides. And the settings.py is actually the configuration file could also be a JSON, YAML, and all the other formats that even uh, Flask supports. 
And secrets is more meant for the merging which happens or cascading which happens along with the settings.py to make sure you're not committing anything or an instance settings kind of a setup. So once we have a config.py, you can even say list, uh, you know, create, add, update kind of co commands. So Dynaconf has a fairly rich CLI that you may want to take a look at, which is the minus minus help. So we've got a config.py, we've got a settings.py, and you'll typically have an app.py or so where you're creating your Flask application. Now you can use the inbuilt provided from Dynaconf import Flask Dynaconf, which essentially says it'll wrap your Flask application and your Dynaconf settings into one, and then just handle the, the migration between them or the integrations between them. Now the main one is just basically, it's using the app.config and replaces app.config with your Dynaconf settings variable. Now that's a pretty neat thing because first of all, all your existing Flask plugins, which are using current app.config, will just start referring to Dynaconf. And the benefit over there is that the, the config API that is provided by Dynaconf is completely compatible with Flask, right? So you can use the dot notation, you can use a square bracket notation, you can use a dot get. All of those are all available at Dynaconf. So migrations become super easy because all your libraries just transparently start using Dynaconf without any problems. And hey, you can also use the init app mechanism if you want to use the init app approach of initializing Flask Dynaconf. So all right, uh, once you've gotten this setup, the next thing that we now care about is extending, right? Because your application should work without any issues just with those two steps that we spoke about. So let's talk about now what are all the benefits that you immediately start reaping when you're talking about or using Dynaconf. So first of all is external sources, which is the first thing that we spoke about. If you want to integrate with HashiCorp Vault or Redis, these are storage mechanisms which are provided by default. So you can just go into your config.py and say vault enabled equal to true and set either environment variables or add certain configurations over here for your URL for your vault, your token for vault and so on and so forth. And Dynaconf will just start leveraging vault and even merge it with your settings files so that you can just put your secrets or your sensitive items in vault, but your normal settings in the settings.py, secrets.py and so on and so forth. And you even have custom storages that I'll come back to but enabling like an external mechanism like Vault or Redis is as easy as that. And it's completely abstracted out to your application and your plugins, right? For all of them, you're just gonna be using settings off and the key that you wanna use. And where it came from is all transparent. Then you have advanced merge strategies and here's where I was fairly wowed by the way Dynaconf handle things. And you know, in Flask, you have this, the basic one, right? Which is you have a name set up in your settings.py and in your instance settings, you have another name. So it goes and overrides the value of name that you had provided earlier. But over here, you can even say, I have a database, which is a dictionary, and I only want to go and modify the username key within that database dictionary without modifying the rest of the data dictionary. So you can use the underscore underscore syntax for that to merge your dictionaries. And you can also merge your lists by using something like a Dynaconf merge keyword. So any list which has Dynaconf merge in the start which is automatically get merged with the original value that you had provided in your previous settings file. So this actually helps you have multiple levels of settings file and every variable, you can choose what kind of merge strategy you want. So you don't need to even repeat, like let's say if you were gonna set your templates, you don't even need to repeat the previous values that you have. Well, the third one was runtime reloading. And this was just you know not something that we really needed in our application. But at some point in time, when we started thinking about uptimes and so on and so forth, much later after we started using Dynaconf, it was pretty cool that Dynaconf had already thought this through for us. So what you can do is you can just say, get fresh with the key that you want to get with your settings, or you can even do fresh equal to true when you're doing a normal get function on Dynaconf. So what this will do is just go and fetch from the external location, whether it's Redis, Vault, settings.py, secrets.py, just go and fetch the value again from that file or from that source. Now, you may not want to actually use these explicit methods of getting fresh values for every get value, or for, for every getter that you're gonna be getting for your settings. You can also set it as an environment variable. So every time you're gonna go and get, let's say a key called name, it'll automatically just try to fetch the freshest value from your source. And you even have a context manager which can handle this for you programmatically. So you just say with settings.fresh and whatever you're gonna be accessing within this context manager, will just be fetched from your source. 
So all of these help you just handle dynamic or well, uh, hot reloading kind of concepts, but you can also do these in production, right? Just saying, I just want to fetch the latest variable for my setting. Then you have validators, which is pretty cool too. So when you, whenever you're going to go with some of your a large number of users trying to set your configurations, especially when you're going to be having multiple instances, you just want to make sure your settings are not going to go and break your application. So you can validate them upfront. You can again specify a schema using the Dynaconf provided validator keyword. And you can say for the name, for the name setting, you want a minimum length, maximum length, must exist equal to true and so on and so forth, right? All the standard validators and even the casting mechanisms are all present at Dynaconf. Now, other than validators, casting becomes an important thing, especially when we are talking about certain storage mechanisms, right? Because let's say, for example, JSON doesn't support date times and you just want to be able to cast it into a date time. So how do you do that? Well, whenever you have limitations, and I'm going to take the example of environment variables, Dynaconf has some access modifiers or converters that you can use. So when you want to set up a port for Flask, instead of writing 3306, which is not the best port to use, but you can just say add the rate integer and just say which port you want to use for Flask. Uh, similarly, if you want a Boolean, you can just say Boolean. If you're talking about a list or any of the more complex uh, data structures, you can just say this is a JSON that needs to be converted by Dynaconf. So Dynaconf will just help you handle some of these issues, right? Well, with environment variables, the biggest issue that happens is everything in an environment variable is a string, but you can actually define what kind of a string it should be converted into, and Dynaconf just handles that for you. And these kind of converters have even been more dynamic in nature, right? Which is where a lot of cool things can be done with Dynaconf and the whole name of Dynaconf comes into the picture. You can actually say you want to use string formatters, right? The, the dot format function in Python. And you can say this dot db host, this dot db port is the path to your database. So you can actually leverage existing configurations using the this keyword or environment variables using the env keyword. So this actually helps you handle string formatting kind of use cases. But you, if you are more of a palettes person, you can also go the way of Jinja and say, I want to actually use a Jinja variable and even the Jinja filters and Jinja functions that you can add along with it, right? So you want to use the environment home slash templates and then convert it into an absolute path. All of these are like modifiers, which Dynacon just comes provided inbuilt. And it's pretty cool because it just helps you to be able to configure your uh, configurations, I guess, or you configure your application in a very easy way, right? Irrespective of the source where it's coming from. And that's the, the important part. And again, you have different other methods of getters, setters, dumps, loading mechanisms, and so on and so forth. So once you've actually figured out how, like all the functionality of Dynacon that we can immediately use, and you should take a look at the website to see the other kind of functionality that's provided. The next thing that you can also take a look at is how to customize the existing functionality. Now, Dynaconf has a few set of APIs. Like you could uh, go ahead and create your own loader, which is the most important one. You could even have your own custom validators and so on and so forth. But I want to more talk about loaders because that's where things actually hit the road for us. Now, one of our, one of our enterprise um, clients basically wanted to have encryption mechanisms provided by Corridor or provided by uh, us instead of going to like a full-fledged HashiCorp solution or so, right? Now, we can easily create various existing mechanisms that are available for encryption. But what we had actually done was we created a custom loader in Dynacon, right? We just said, yeah, we just need to define a def load and then go and configure this in Dynacon as an existing loader from our module that we need to load. And in this loader, you have the object, you have the environment variables, uh, you have silent equal to true, the key that you're trying to fetch in case you're trying to do fresh uh, fetching and actually your file name if you have a custom file name that you're trying to load from. Now, with this, you're basically free to write whatever you wanna do, right? You have a bunch of helper functions that exist like object.set, object.update and so on and so forth. But the logic that you want to write here can be anything. And that's why separation of concerns kind of becomes important, right? Because if you want to get your variables from environment, that's fine. You can actually write a, a, a loader over here and then configure it in Dynacon. 
if you want to get it from, let's say some AWS key store that you're using, you can again, just have like an AWS loader, which can then go and read it from the appropriate location and then access it. So the good thing that you have over here is you can actually create custom loaders with the right kind of logic to fetch your configuration from external locations, which are not even provided by Dynacons. And then either do pre-processing logic also, if you want to do. So that's what we did at Corridor. We use the very popular cryptography library to be able to go and encrypt settings that we may want to do. Now you could also use existing external libraries, which are ready made available, or you could even use cloud solutions, which are ready to use. All of them can be just configured within a loader, right? And there are many other APIs that you can take a look at with Dynacons. You know, the, the code itself, if you look at it in GitHub is pretty well written and fairly modular. So you can even just go through the code and just take a look at how you may, how you may want to customize Dynacon. So that's about it for Dynacon. You know, using this approach of easy to migrate, leveraging the existing capabilities, and then customizing that capability itself, we've been able to use Dynaconf in a lot of fairly complex, but still manage our simple use cases without any major issues. And it's been a pretty interesting experience that we've had at Corridor of just using Dynaconf in the right way. If you had any questions, you can always reach out to me on GitHub at abdelijk, or just shoot me an email at abdelikothari at gmail.com. And do take a look at the references. So you can take a look at Dynaconf and 12-factor application, definitely. But you can also take a look at some of the other configuration managers that we were taking a look at and evaluating when we were looking at Dynacon. Now, Traitlets, which is being used by Jupyter, Config Parser, Decouple, PrettyConf, AnyConfig, all of these are pretty neat libraries. But I think the kind of architecture which Dynaconf has, which just makes it easy to use, but still fairly flexible to use for any kind of enterprise architecture, was not, was not something that we got very easily with these libraries. And so we kind of just chose to go ahead with Dynacon. All right, thanks a lot.